This is Twit. I don't know if I'm quite from the era to have used this. I don't think I am. I think my first machine was like a 386, but I know what this is about. Rob, take it away. Give us the background. Tell us what this thing is and uh, why only old people know about it. Oh, all right. <laughs> so in a historic move, and that's why Ken knows about it, because it's historic. Nah. <laughs> Microsoft continues to open source more of its code. Before we know it, all of Microsoft's code will be open source. Just wait for Windows. So anyway, okay, so 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 maybe the move itself isn't that historic, but the code that they are opening up is. So back in the late 1900s, <laughs> like 1970s to be more precise. Wouldn't that be the mid 1900s? No, mid's more like 1950, 1960. It's it's the late already. I don't know, but. So in the late 1970s, or in the mid 1970s, uh, Altair Basic helped millions learn coding on emerging microcomputers. And I think Ken was one of them. Microsoft began work on the 6502 microprocessor interpreter port of Basic in 1976, and Commodore licensed it, licensed it for its Pet Vic 20 and Commodore 64 computers in 1977. So preservationists uh, like Michael Steele spent years rebuilding the original environment to ensure the code could still run today. He documented and rebuilt the original basic processor for multiple targets and ported it to modern assembl assemblers like uh, CC65. Uh, making it possible to build and run on current systems. All of this was packed into 8K of memory and apparently contains an Easter egg uh, hidden in there by Bill Gates himself. Well, uh, break, break out of, time to break out that Commodore 64, Ken. I'm sure you've never put it away because 48 years after its release, Microsoft Basic for the 6502 is back and is now open sourced and available on GitHub for folks like you to continue to hack on and enjoy for years to come. So go ahead and fork it, clone it, improve it, or just sit there and admire a piece of computing history. I haven't really used basic myself, visual basic. Yeah, basics a little before my, uh, my technical time. Uh -huh. See, I, I cut my programming teeth on QBasic. Uh, that's what I had when I was a kid. That's what I had available. But it's not as good as Atari Basic. I have never messed with Atari Basic. Rob, you, you said you could run this on the Commodore 64. You actually have to go back a generation or two. It's the Commodore Pet that this will run on. Uh, they said they said in 1976 that the Pet Vic 20 and the 64 com computers. Well, uh, when you go when you go to the the repo to the Basic repo, it specifically calls out the Commodore Pet. And not any of the others, but maybe hmm. it maybe that is not a complete list. That would actually be a lot of fun to, to compile your own um, version of Basic for the Commodore sixty four. It's a fun idea. I think what it is is a. Uh, it was originally written to for the Commodore Pet, but they ported it to the Vic twenty and the sixty four. Yeah, that could be. It might be exactly what it is. Um, you know, it's fun. It's fun to see Microsoft doing this sort of thing. Um, I I wish that they would just sort of have a, well, I wish the term on copyright was not 120 years or whatever it is these days. Mm. Um, because when you're talking about things like video games and computing, that is such a long time that w we have multiple important pieces of history that are getting lost to history because that copyright time is so long and people can't legally archive them. Uh, but I wish more companies would do this sort of thing and just have a policy. Like once a code base is 20 years old, right? That seems like a more appropriate time. Once a code base is 20 years old, we just release it public domain. Once we stop making money on it, we release it to the public domain. Uh, sure, sure. I'm fine with that. I have no problem with the company making money on their source code. I make money on source code. It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice to be able to pay your rent by doing the thing that you enjoy doing. 
right? Like that's, that's a cool thing. I, I will not give anybody grief for that, but I, I just, I hate, I, I like things that are open source. I think that's the way to do it. But what I really hate is code and parts of history getting lost mm-hmm. because of copyright and DMCA and even patents in some cases. And the type of media it's being stored on. Well, that's, yes, right? So, like, that is part of this. So, you, you think about floppy disks. Like, so what, what was it that, uh, you know, the, the old saying, um, they, they did a whole, Bill Gates kind of started this, and they did the whole media campaign. Don't copy that floppy. I think there's even a jingle that went with it, right? <laughs> well, okay, so if you don't copy the floppy, and then the floppy deteriorates to where you can no longer read it, then you have lost the data. And if everybody oh, doesn't copy the floppy, and everybody's disks deteriorate, then that data does not exist anymore. It's not great. I thought you guys were going to have to jump in with some more words of wisdom, but I guess I, I guess I nailed it and you were just speechless. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out the Untitled Linux show. You can find us in your favorite podcasting app or subscribe to our YouTube channel down in the links below. See you there. <laughs>